Hello and welcome to this edition of Joint Action. This podcast is dedicated to all those out there who have osteoarthritis. On the show, we unpack the truths and demystify the myths about the disease and its management. If you have joint pain and want to know more about how to manage it from the world's best experts, you've come to the right place. Without further ado, it is time to welcome your host, David Hunter. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Joint Action Podcast, where we have the wonderful opportunity to talk about effective psychological treatments for adults struggling with chronic physical health conditions like osteoarthritis. Now, having a chronic physical health condition such as osteoarthritis can have a negative effect on mental health, which commonly manifests as depression or anxiety. Epidemiologic research has shown that most adults with common mental health conditions don't access psychologically based treatments. This could be due to any one of a number of reasons, including cost, stigma, long waiting lists, and availability outside major cities. On this episode of Joint Action, we're joined by Professor Blake Deer to discuss the impact of mental health on the management of osteoarthritis and effective psychological treatments that can help to improve mental health in the long term. Professor Blake Deer is a senior clinical psychologist within the Department of Psychology at Macquarie University. Blake completed his postgraduate master's training at the University of Western Sydney in 2006 and later completed his PhD in 2010. Blake is the director of the eCenter Clinic, a research unit that develops and evaluates a range of psychologically based treatments for common mental health and chronic physical health conditions. He is passionate about increasing access to effective psychological treatment particularly for adults struggling with chronic physical health conditions. Hello, Blake, and welcome to the show. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. No, it's a, it's a pleasure, and it's a really, really important topic that I think a lot of our listeners will get a lot of content and meaningful engagement from. But before we get into the main content, what I'd like to do is just to get to know you a little bit better. Can you share with the listeners a little bit more about your background and what a typical day might look like? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So I'm uh, a clinical psychologist by training and finished my clinical training in, I think it was 2006. Uh, and I'm a professor of clinical psychology at Macquarie University. Uh, I lead a, a research unit that develops, evaluates and tries to implement a whole range of different psychological interventions for people with common mental health and chronic physical health conditions. And so my work is around developing those interventions and evaluating them with people. I lead a team that does that now. In my early days, I was actually developing the programs and supporting people through those programs, trying to get grants and things like that to do my work. And now most of my work is supporting other clinicians and, and researchers to run trials and, and work with people. So it's much more of a management and leadership role now. Have you enjoyed that transition from, I guess, being in the coal face to supervising the people getting the coal out? I do, um, but I, it's not what I expected. My whole career is, when I think back to date, there's lots of chance, uh, not a lot of planning, I think. But I do really enjoy it. It's great. I do miss working with people um, through the programs. I still get to do it occasionally, but I do also enjoy supporting others, their development, their research careers and clinical work. But it's been a learning. It's different. It's a diff completely different skill set, what you expect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was listening to something recently about the, the Peter principle, which is, you know, how people graduate to positions of management and what skills they have acquired along the way and whether people who are, you know, necessarily good clinicians or psychologists or researchers, whether they're also good with people management, because I don't think we necessarily do much training or development in that space. And then because we're successful in one area, it's assumed that we're, we're going to be successful in another. I don't think it necessarily follows hand in hand. No, I agree entirely. And there's not much support around that transition either professionally in the research world or the clinical world, I don't think. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you used to apply for grants. Do you still apply for grants? Is what you do less dependent upon that now? 
I do still apply for grants, but far fewer than I used to. Most of my work now is supporting other people in the team to apply for grants to support their roles and work. I also have a an NHMRC fellowship at the moment that supports most of the research that I want to do and need to do. I will, though, that ends in, I think, two years' time. I don't like to think about it, but um, that will means probably in the next year or two I'll be applying again with a lot more rigour and intensity than I have the last couple of years. Yeah. That probably introduces its own emotional trauma for you. So let's, let's not get too much into that. So when you're not at work, what do you like doing? It's a good question. Um, I used to be very heavily into road cycling and most of my time away from work, I'd be on the bike. But I've got two young kids at the moment, five and a half year old and a three and a half year old. So when I'm not at work, most of my time is actually about trying to get them outdoors playing. Uh, We're just learning to ride bikes at the moment uh, and scooters without falling over. And that's a lot of fun. But so that's most of my time away from work at the moment. Uh, it sounds wonderful, but it sounds like ultimately with the intent that they'll get out on the road bike as well in time. Is that right? That would be ideal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would be amazing. Now, if you had to describe yourself in five words, what would they be? I think this is uh, these questions are often good for other people to answer as well. I would say curious, friendly, uh, probably jovial, practical, and tangential. I think I can be very tangential as well. Okay, well, let's, let's explore that as we go through this topic today. Now, the, obviously, the topic at hand is critically important for our population, a large number of whom have many of the common mental health conditions that we're likely to get into. But before I put my foot in my mouth too firmly, what are the common mental health conditions that you think, or that you know, rather, occur in people that have uh, chronic health problems? The most common are the depressive disorders, so depression and anxiety disorders. We know that about, I think it depends where you get your statistics from, but about 6% of the Australian population will experience depression and about 7% will experience an anxiety disorder. And that's fairly consistent across the Western world, at least the data I know. And when you go into people or look at people with chronic physical health conditions, It's the same thing, except the prevalence is roughly double. So we're looking at about 12 to 13% and 14 to 15% respectively for anxiety and depression. Yeah. And why is that? And I know that's probably a really unfair question, but why does the prevalence of those mental health conditions increase? Is that cause or a consequence or are they unrelated? That's a, it's a really good question. I, in terms of definitively, I'm not sure. I think it's chronic health conditions obviously increase the risk of anxiety and depression through, the, I think, the impacts they have on people's lives. You know, they can affect almost every area of someone's life, their relationships, their work, their hobbies, their ability to do what's important to them. And if, if those things are affected, then obviously that puts us at risk of low mood, sadness, depression. Similarly, they can... Um, put a lot of stress on people financially, can raise concerns about the future, raise, I guess, fears and concerns about how people will go about their day-to-day life. Um, And that's, I think, where, you know, increased risk of anxiety can come from. Anxiety and depression themselves can also probably increase risk of developing chronic physical health conditions through their impacts on people's behaviour. If you pick depression, for example, we know that People often struggle with motivation, withdraw from everyday activities, can struggle with healthy routines, uh, healthy eating. And of course, that can put people at risk of disease as well or, you know, poorer health. So it's probably a bit of both, really. Yeah, no, it's I think most of the literature that I'm familiar with would also suggest it's somewhat bi-directional in terms of the relationship between the two. Now, you started getting into it, but I just want to explore it a little bit further so that Um, recognition on the part of our listeners might be simpler, but how would depression or how would anxiety typically manifest? How would a person know that that might be uh, a concern for them? I would kind of think about this in terms of the emotional experience and then the behavioral experience as a way of figuring it out. So, and identifying when you're struggling with these things. So if we think about depression, it's People are struggling with hopelessness, helplessness, a loss of interest and pleasure from everyday things, usually things that they've enjoyed or done in the past. And so that's the the kind of feeling aspect of depression. 
The behavioural aspect is people often withdraw. They stop doing things they used to do. They withdraw from friends and family, hobbies. And so that's, a, a, I guess, a thing to, to keep an eye out for. If we look at anxiety, um, we look at the emotional aspect of that. People, it's, it's the experience of fears and worries. And it can be fears and worries about a single thing you know, for example, like social fears, but it can be fears and worries about lots of different things uh, in people's lives. And if we look at anxiety behaviourally, what we see is that people tend to avoid things. And so when people start avoiding things that are important to them, that they'd like to do, that they used to do, that's also often a sign of anxiety. So they're the kinds of things that I would be looking out for. Yeah, wonderful. And are there any online resources or anything that you might like to point a person towards that might assist in recognition of that? Not that we should necessarily be using Google as our healthcare professional, but is there any way for a person to ascertain whether that's the case or not? There's now lots of digital services and resources that provide tests, like little tests for people and and information that can help them to identify whether they're experiencing anxiety and depression. A really good site uh, or or clinic that I'm involved in is the MindSpot Clinic. And a simple Google of MindSpot will find the site and there's lots of great information there for people. Wonderful. Now, let's work on the assumption that the numbers are approximately what you said. And I think that's broadly consistent with what I have read in the literature, that about 20% of people that have osteoarthritis have some concomitant a mental health condition. And, and again, the most common ones are the ones you mentioned, depression, anxiety. Um, the other ones that we often hear spoken about include catastrophizing and whether that's an, an aberrant response to the health condition or an overarching uh, response to that. Just wondering whether that's something that you encounter and the people that you see, and is it something that you see frequently as well? Definitely. Yeah. I, I would think about catastrophizing almost as a fairly normal response to a a chronic or a significant physical health condition. And when we say catastrophizing, what we, I guess, are referring to is, uh, it's really hard to describe actually, but kind of an exaggerated concern or or sense of the impact of something on on someone's life. I don't like the term, although we use it and it's helpful clinically. I don't like it for people because I do think it's quite a normal response. You know, you are diagnosed or you develop a condition and then you worry about what that condition means for you. It's, it's likely impact on your life. And at that point, it's normal because you, you often don't know very much about the condition. You have no sense of how successfully it can be managed, what you can do to, to manage it, keep it under control, whether it's going to get worse or stay the same. And really, it's only through time and working with good health professionals and developing your own understanding that you can learn not to catastrophize. At least that's what I would say. And for people who have, who we find, and we do see a lot of people who get really stuck in worries and concern about their condition and what it means, which is catastrophizing, it's often because they haven't got good information or haven't managed to locate and organize a team of health professionals around them that can help them to understand and not be so worried, I guess. Yeah. No, I think that's really helpful. Now, for those people that do have a mental health condition, I just want to touch upon a little bit the interplay between that mental health condition and their other chronic health conditions, such as osteoarthritis, and what influence that mental health condition might have on their experience of both pain and and dealing with their osteoarthritis. We touched upon it a little bit, but I just wonder if you might like to expand on that a little bit further. Yeah, I'll try my best. We, we know that uh, mental health difficulties can affect people's experience and trajectory with chronic health conditions like OA in lots of different ways. One is, I guess, that they can rob people of their motivation and confidence to learn about and learn about the things they can do to manage their condition. So that's one obvious way that it affects people. They're not confident to do any exercise or to go out or to change how they do things. They may not be motivated for that. It can also affect how people engage with their health professionals. And for example, if they're prescribed medication, 
they may not take their medications because they don't have the motivation, they can't remember, they're out of a routine. They may really struggle to, to stick to lifestyle recommendations around what to eat and how to exercise and how to get enough sleep directly as a result of, of anxiety and depression. But we also know that uh, anxiety and depression can increase people's experience of different symptoms. So pain is a common one where we know that when people are struggling with depression or are stressed and anxious, for a whole range of reasons, they tend to experience pain as more severe. That's also true of, I believe, dizziness and fatigue. And this is kind of outside my area, although we know this well, but because, uh, because of the involvement in the brain in both anxiety and depression, mental health, and then the experience of these symptoms, there are mechanisms there that can make them uh, more severe, uh, make pain more severe, make fatigue more severe, yeah, and make people feel more dizzy, I guess, as well. Yeah, and I think that's a, a wonderful summary of a very complicated area. And I think it's really important for people who might have one of these mental health conditions who concomitantly might also have osteoarthritis to understand the critical impact that they have on one another, particularly, as Blake said, you know, in terms of motivation, getting engaged in lifestyle and other behavioral changes, but also the effects that this might have on increasing sensitization or sensitivity to the person's experience of pain. And I'm hoping that some of that information, if it relates to you, may motivate you to go and get something done about it. Because at least as, as a clinician who not infrequently sees People who have osteoarthritis with one of these common mental health conditions, if we don't address it, our ability to change behavior, to get people to exercise, to lose weight is incredibly hard. And we know that their experience of the disease will be a lot worse in that common context if we didn't do anything about it. So that brings us to, okay, so let's, let's work on the assumption that this might be relevant to some of our patients and that they've got one or other of these mental health conditions. What can be done about it? Well, lots of things. I would, as a clinical psychologist in my area, I would advocate for psychology. Even where people aren't struggling with severe anxiety and depression, I think a lot of people, and it's hard to get a good sense, but a lot of people when they develop a, a significant physical health condition, face challenges adjusting to that, you know, um, managing its impacts on, their, on all the areas of their life. And I think that's where psychology can have a big role. So you don't just need to have clear-cut anxiety and depression on, on top of osteoarthritis. It can be helpful to get help to talk through how it is impacting your life and coming up with strategies and getting support to manage the impacts of a condition like OA on, on your life. Um, so where can they get help? Well, Focusing in on psychology, I break it down into two different pathways. One is getting face-to-face -face help from a, a psychologist or a group who are running a, a self-management program, say within a hospital or somewhere like that. It doesn't, they're not always run by psychologists, um, physiotherapists and, and other allied health professionals will lead them. The other pathway is via a digital service, which I'm very passionate about and where my, my work is. And digital services, there are relatively new phenomena uh, in psychology anyway. I think they've all been, uh, it's all been sped up and changed by COVID. But these services essentially aim to provide all the same information and support and help people to learn self-management skills that you would get face-to-face, -face, but they do it via carefully developed modules and platforms that mean people don't need to leave their home. They can do it from their phone or their laptop or tablet at a time that works for them. So I think these are these two kind of broad pathways for support from a psychological perspective. And the modalities of what a psychologist would do, whether that be in person or delivered digitally, are they similar in terms of the, the type and style of intervention that might be used in this context? And how would that be operationalized? They should be. Um, one of the things I would say is it's chronic health condition is a, is a major part of the difficulties you're having. Then it's important to see a psychologist or uh, access a program, I think, that's designed for people with chronic physical health conditions, because there are some adjustments that are made in, in what's kind of the focus. When you look at psychological interventions and you look at the ones that are effective, I think what you find is they generally provide people 
with a couple of things. One is information to help people understand, I guess, their psychology and how a condition might be impacting them. Another one is they teach people skills to proven kind of skills, very basic self-management skills that they can use to manage the impacts of those conditions on their life and on their mental health. And then over the top of that, they provide support over time for people to think about and use that information and learn those skills to make changes in how they manage their condition and manage its impacts on them. And so you can do that face-to-face. And when that happens, it's usually via a lot of discussion and talking, but you can also do that via, you can, I guess, transfer some that information and the teaching of those skills to online modules, which is more of what you get in a digital program. What are some of the common skills that might be being taught there, Blake? We would usually teach someone about the cycle of symptoms, um, teach people to understand the difficulties they're having and how they're all interacting with one another. It's almost you can think about it as like a problem map for people. We then teach them skills like thought challenging to help people uh, uh, manage their thinking about their condition and its impacts so that they're keeping their thinking really realistic and helpful. We teach them de-arousal strategies for, I guess, reducing stress and physical tension which can be really important when people are you know, experiencing a, an increase in pain, for example. We teach people what we call graded exposure, which is really a, a strategy for breaking down something that you need to do that's difficult or that you're fearful of and breaking it down into really small pieces so you can gradually build your confidence and your ability to do something. Uh, we would teach goal setting, uh, teach people how to uh, make and set goals so they kind of avoid failure experiences, I guess, trying to do too much too fast. We teach people about managing relationships and problem solving. And to some extent, it depends a little bit on what the difficulties the person is having from that initial work, understanding the difficulties they're having. And thinking about operationalizing this for a person who comes along to the digitally delivered program, what's involved in terms of time? Who are they interfacing with? Uh, Is it all being delivered over the internet? Um, How how does it work and how long does that go for? So there's lots of different variations out there. I'll speak to our kind of general approach and programs, but what people would do generally is they come to a website They'd read about the condition. They'd read about one of the programs we were offering. They would then do an online screening assessment, which might take about 15 to 20 minutes, where they provide us with a good sense of the difficulties they're having, treatment they might have seen, some sense of what kind of help they're looking for. We would then follow that up with a, um, a telephone call from a psychologist where we would answer questions. We'd run through that assessment gather some more information and really make sure the course is right for them and what they're looking for. At that point, we might get a sense that they actually haven't spoken to their doctor for a long time, actually, and things might have might be getting worse or progressing. So before we put them in a course, we might recommend they go back and speak to their doctor. Assuming it's what they want and it's, it's suitable, though, we would then work with them to identify a time when they wanted to run through a program. Uh, we like to have a start date and an end date for our programs. They typically run for eight to 10 weeks. And so people would pick a start date, usually a Monday. And from there, actually, there's a structure where people would get a series of emails that would let them know that everything was set up and they were ready to start. They could get started and that a lesson was available. And they'd go in, they'd read that lesson. They'd think about what in there uh, uh, was relevant to them, what wasn't, what questions they had. And then they would, if they wanted, they would then have a telephone call with a, uh, one of the psychologists who would talk to them about that, answer questions, discuss what's relevant, what's not relevant, and start to troubleshoot with them about what they might use from that, that lesson. That would progress for about eight weeks. There's usually about five to six kind of lessons or modules over that period of time. They take about 10 to 15 minutes to read. They're not very difficult to read. And then throughout that period, there'd be all that support from a psychologist as needed. And people would be slowly 
thinking about and practicing the skills introduced in their day-to-day lives um, over that eight weeks. And at the end of the eight weeks, what type of effect benefit might they perceive or gain from the program? So it depends a little bit on the program, but if we pick one of our programs for people that would be relevant with you know, um, chronic pain and osteoarthritis, we would typically see about a 30 to 35% improvement in depression, symptoms of depression, a 30% improvement in symptoms of anxiety. We would see a, a roughly an, a 15 to 20% improvement in people's self-rated kind of disability or the interference of that condition on, on their life. And we would see roughly a 10 to 20% improvement in uh, average pain level over that period of time. Fantastic. And so that's at eight weeks. Is that usually sustained over a longer period of time as well in terms of the benefit that you might notice? In our own programs, yes. So what we find is in terms of, of mental health symptoms, what we find at the end of uh, our programs is maintained for up to two years. And that's true of pain as well, reductions in pain. When we look at disability, it is this really interesting pattern where it seems to improve between post-treatment and three-month follow-up, a follow-up period, and then it's maintained for, from there for up to two years. It's hard to know what's going on there, but we think it's because the programs have people have been struggling with their, their health for a long time. The programs are very brief. And in terms of the impacts that it has on their day-to-day lives, it takes longer than eight weeks, obviously, for those impacts to, to happen. And so there is this further improvement over the follow-up period. Sounds wonderful. Now, do you have any practical tips for people out there who have osteoarthritis other than what we've already spoken about? Probably a couple, if I can share a couple. So one is just from all my experience working with people with osteoarthritis, chronic pain and different conditions, you really need to find a a GP and a a specialist that you can work with. From all my experience, those people that have those doctors that they can work with, it makes a huge difference to their ability to then learn how they can self-manage and what they can do. The other one I would say is to take time to learn about your condition We're most used to acute conditions. I think until we develop a chronic health condition, we're most used to acute conditions and they're conditions that are going to get better with time or we go see the doctor, the doctor gives us a treatment and then it it gets better. But chronic conditions we know are very, very different. They're things that are going to progress and or are going to continue. And what we do is important. So I think what we do to manage our own condition is important. So I think a big part of that is is learning about the condition and what we can do to manage it and improve how we manage it. The last little thing I would say as a psychologist is make change slowly. I think slow change is better than um, big, fast change. And I think that's one of the big areas where we all fall over. Um, We get very motivated to make a change in our lives somewhere and we go too big, too fast. And if you manage to do that and maintain it, that's excellent, but that's not most of us. For most of us, making small incremental changes that we can maintain and build on over time is the most important thing. So sorry, just a couple of things I've thrown at you. No, that's fantastic. And I think really practical, helpful advice for a lot of people who are out there. Now, historically, uh, mental health conditions used to be associated with a lot of stigma and a lot of people used to run away from treatment or not not want to recognize that. I think that's a lot better than what it was, but I'm I'm sure that's still an issue. But are there are there other barriers that are common that you see for people accessing care, whether that be cost, you know, waiting time to see a psychologist, identifying a program, stigma that we might want to demystify a little bit and hopefully reduce some of those barriers? I think a lot of people we work with anyway are quite overwhelmed with the health care that they need for their condition. And so there's a lot of physical things they need to do. And actually, they a lot know that some uh, mental health support or intervention would be helpful. But actually, they're so busy just with the physical side of things. And it can be hard in that case then to go, well, in the little bit of time I have left or energy I have left to go see a psychologist. So I think that's actually a big barrier for people. But I do think Again, that's one of the benefits of the digital approach is it makes it much more accessible for people. 
and it's a much smaller commitment. You know, if, it, if it's not working or you don't like it, you can stop quite easily. I think mobility is another big barrier that's often not talked about. Some of the people we work with, it, it takes them a long time to get ready in the morning and they often, some will, will need a lot of care from other people. And so going to see someone face-to-face is, is a lot of work and preparation for them. And again, that's where I think telehealth and, and digital options are really valuable now. Yeah. No, that's, uh, again, wonderful advice and really thoughtful reflections on what your experience has been. Now, any other final points or tips about the topic and or resources that you want to point people towards that we can include in the show notes so that people can access them? Maybe some shameless self-promotion, but I think the MindSpot Clinic has a really good resource on 10 tips for emotional resilience, but it's a one-page or two-page document and developed based on a lot of experience working with different people. And I think that's a great resource for people. Superb. So we'll, we'll include a link to that in the show notes for people who want to access that. So Blake, now we get back into the uh, interrogation of Blake Deer a little bit and just seeing, seeing where he's at and what makes him tick. But this is a rapid fire round. So I'm just going to throw questions at you. Just come back with a rapid response. But favorite book? Bad Science by Ben Goldacre. Dog or a cat person? Dog. Favorite quote? Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. <laughs> What is your favorite food? Lasagna. Do you have a bad habit? Uh, eating a tub of ice cream with my wife on the couch. <laughs> Where would you next like to go on holiday? Probably Japan, I think. What superpower would you have if you could have one? To be able to teleport. And if you could meet anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Probably Marcus Aurelius, the... Um, Emperor and Stoic philosopher. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm a, a big fan of Stoicism and Seneca and those folks. So, yeah, that's great. What would you do if money were not an issue? I wouldn't change much about my life, but I would probably get more help with what's called life admin, you know, cleaning, cooking, traveling. <laughs> all, all of the important things that you probably don't get a lot of time to do. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now, what motivates you? Why do you do what you do? At a high level, I like a good problem. And I think increasing access to psychological care for people with chronic disease is a really good problem. I was motivated by it, actually, because in my clinical training, I did a couple of um, stints in tertiary pain services. And it was really inter- really interesting and really sad that people were coming to these services after you know, five to six years of struggling to manage pain. And then we'd provide them with some basic information and skills which would make a big change. And then they'd say, well, why didn't anyone tell me this five or six years ago? Uh, And so that really stuck with me very early on. And so that's the fact that we can now provide that access digitally motivates me. Yeah, it's a great motivation because there's still a great need for multidisciplinary clinics that are out there. And they'll never probably meet the need that's out there in the community. But as you've just intimated, providing digital access that provides better accessibility for our patient population is critical. Now, if you could have a billboard with anything on us, what would it be and why? Probably speak to yourself like you would speak to others. Be kind and gentle, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of people, at least a lot of people we work with, they they have an internal voice that's very critical and unsupportive. And that's not how they are when they speak to other people. They're usually very supportive and understanding. And so if we can encourage people to turn that inwards, I think I'd do a billboard on that. And just in closing, is there any one piece of advice, knowledge or wisdom that you'd like to give to people out there who have osteoarthritis? I would just encourage them to seek care if they are struggling, talk to their doctors and consider, you know, a psychological approach. Give it a try if they are struggling. That's wonderful. Blake, thank you so much for the time, the massive contributions that you make to to our patient population and hopefully the ongoing contributions that you'll continue to make moving forward. It's been a great pleasure to have a chance to chat to you for a while. Thanks, David. Thanks for the opportunity to be involved and to talk on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this incredibly important episode. I cannot overemphasize the important contributions that Blake is making 
to this particular area. But in particular, I really want to emphasize to you that if you're struggling with this disease, and in particular, if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, stress, or not coping particularly well with the disease manifestation, don't do anything other than seek help. These have a really important role to play in your ability to engage with other aspects of care. For us to change your behavior, whether that be around increasing activity, strengthening exercise, losing weight, if you're depressed or anxious, your ability to be motivated to engage in those activities will be in large part negated. In addition, chronic mental health conditions will have a big role to play in sensitization and making your experience of the disease, particularly pain, worse as a consequence of depression, anxiety, and stress. So please do seek help. There are lots of different avenues. We've obviously spoken about one today, but don't take this lying down. Deal with it and get as much help as you can. It's critical for the management of your disease and your general health long-term. Thank you again so much for the privilege to speak to you about this really important topic. Thanks for your contributions to the Joint Action Podcast. And between now and when I next speak to you, please do take care of yourself. And if you have the opportunity, someone else as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.